Amen. Happy New Year. Welcome to Grace Community Church. I'm Pastor Brooks. I'll be bringing you the word this morning. Uh, New Year starts a new series. We're going to be going through the Gospel of John as part of our Engage campaign. Our goal is to engage our Heavenly Father through the person of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, to engage one another as a, as a gospel community, and to engage our culture on a gospel mission. So that's what we're about here at Grace Community Church. We're going to use our Sunday morning time for quite some time uh, to study John's gospel, John's gospel. Now, for those of you that, uh, how many of you are here at Grace Community Church when we went through Luke? You remember that? How long did it take us to get through Luke? Two or three years. Okay, a long time. It's not going to take quite as long, but it is going to be a longer series. And for those of you that get panicked because, oh, it's going to get boring, uh, not that John's gospel gets boring, but being in it forever because I take forever to go through something, we're actually going to break it up. We'll do like 13, 14 weeks, then we'll do like a a shorter series So to uh, on some topical vision things in terms of where we're headed as a church. So promise that the Gospel of John is going to be an enriching, enriching study. Um, Encourage you to bring uh, your friends out. This is going to be a series that is going to be designed specifically for, for you as followers of Christ and for people that don't know Christ. This will be uh, the, type of, uh, the type of series that speaks equally both to those who have been following Jesus for a number of years and to those who aren't really sure who Jesus is and, and, and are weighing whether or not he is someone that they want to follow. So we're going to cover uh, the first half of the first chapter. We're going to take about the next three weeks to go through that. So I'm going to read uh, the scripture that uh, we're going to be in this morning. And actually, technically, we're only going to cover one word in, in the, first, uh, the first chapter uh, this morning. We're going to read the whole uh, verse four, the four, for 14 verses, but we're going to hone in on one word and then we'll, we'll break, it, uh, break it down as we go. So please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1. Verse 1 of chapter 1 begins this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world, although the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Heavenly Father, we ask that You would reveal Your Son, the Word, via the Holy Spirit as we read Your Word, written for us, um, inspired by you, Father. We pray that you would make your scripture come alive. Help me to teach accurately and clearly uh, the things that you have laid before us. And I pray, Father, that you would touch hearts. Uh, Father, if there's someone here this morning who does not yet understand who you are, and I pray that you'd be drawing them to yourself. And for those who have been following you for a number of years, I pray that they may, we might know you more deeply, uh, that we might know you more intimately, and that our life would be given meaning and purpose because of who you are. Lord, I pray these things that Christ might be exalted and glorified. It's in his name we pray, amen. I'm going to start with the last part of the book, and then we'll come back to chapter 1. John gives the purpose for his gospel in the closing chapters of the gospel of John post-resurrection. So Jesus has died on the cross. Jesus has risen again. He's appeared to the apostles. And John says concerning everything that he's already written that we're going to go through, He says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, 
you may have life in his name. So that's the purpose of this gospel. The purpose is he gives it to us through the Holy Spirit so that you and I, the readers, might come to know who Christ is and that in knowing him, we might have life. But that begs the question, what kind of life is John talking about? If you're asking many Christians, they assume, the assumption is, is when they get to that verse in verse 31, that we may have life in his name, the automatic default mode is, oh, he's talking about so that we can have eternal life. Now, is that true? Yes, it's true, but that's, what do you mean by eternal life? For too many Christians, what they mean is they see Christ as a means to an end, and the end is heaven. But what about the next 70 years if you're in your 20s or, or, or teens? What about the next 10 years if you're, if you're up there in age? So, so what are we supposed to do in the meantime? Does not Christ speak to, 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 to anything regarding between then and now? John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, I came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. This life that John is speaking of here in chapter 20, verse 31, is not merely the eternal life you have starting from the point in time when you die and you're with Jesus, but this life, he's talking about a life that's worth living here and now, a life full of purpose and full of meaning. Came across this quote recently by Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, there's the two most important days in your life are the day that you're born and the day that you find out why. Okay? Let that sink in. The two most important days, your birthday, and the day that you figure out why you were born. Why are you here? That question seems deep and seems philosophical, but until you come to grips with that question, you're just going to drift through life. You're just going to drift through life. And what we're going to talk about here as we look at the next four verses are that question. Why are you here? I've had a number of meetings with different individuals over the last year and a half, the last year, and this is a common reoccurring theme. I'll be meeting with a guy, and he'll be struggling with something. His life is, uh, is, is kind of out of kilter. And I've heard this so many times over the last year from lots of different individuals. The refrain goes like this. I'm 40-some years old. I'm 30-some years old. I'm 20-some years old. I've done X, Y, and Z, and what's the point? What's the point? What is life all about? In other words, I've, I've defined my reason for existence in success, money, women, whatever. And to be gender neutral here, I've defined my existence in terms of uh, my spouse, my family, all of these different things, and I'm, I'm realizing that that's, it doesn't fulfill. It doesn't fulfill. And the question of why are you here looms, looms. You have to deal with that question, and that's what the Gospel of John is going to help us address. Now, if we're going to address this question seriously, and everybody addresses this question at some point in time, at some point in time, you know, you get the busyness of life, you can kind of push aside those deeper questions and, you know, I got a job to do, I got a family to raise or what have you, I got school to go to, I'll worry about the bigger questions later when I have time. They will hit you right in the mouth if you don't address them now. They'll come around and they'll come around hard. Why are you here? And if you're seriously going to address this question, you've got to start with the beginning. Not Mark Twain's the beginning as in the day you were born, but the beginning, the beginning. And not only that, you also have to, you have to start with the person or at least consider the person of Jesus. You say, well, I'm willing to start at the beginning, but why do I have to start with Jesus? Because Jesus was there at the beginning, or at least he claims that he was. And if any serious inquirers are, are serious about what life is all about, you have to at least explore what does the person of Jesus Christ speak to uh, concerning the reason for, for, for being. And John is going to address that. John is one of the 12 apostles. John is one of the 12 apostles, but he's also one of Jesus' closest friends. There's, there's three among the 12, Peter, James, and John, who are kind of Jesus' inner circle. 
uh, the 12 would go off and then Jesus would pull out these three and he would take these three to the Mount of Transfiguration. He, would, he was always pulling them aside. John even refers to himself later in the Gospel of John as the one whom Jesus loved. Not saying that, John's not saying that he didn't love the others, but he had a, a special affinity and affection for John. At the foot of the cross, at the foot of the cross, when Jesus was, one of his last words where he looks down at John and he says, woman, behold your son, speaking to John, and he says, John, take care of my mom. I mean, this is, this is his best friend. So if there's anyone in the scriptures who is qualified to speak to the person of Jesus Christ concerning what he has to do with our reason for existence, it would be the Apostle John. So let's take a look at what he says. Scripture that I read, the first four verses, he says quite a bit. We could break this scripture out and we could spend months and months just on these four verses alone. But very quickly, let's go through. He says, in the beginning, in the beginning was the word. The beginning is the beginning. In other words, before there was a beginning, before time began, before matter existed, okay, before the Big Bang, not referring to the TV series, but before, before the universe came into being, time, space, and matter, in the beginning was the Word. You say, well, that's a curious way to begin a book about Jesus, using an abstract concept, the Word, the Greek word is logos, the Word. But he goes on, he's not finished. Not only was the Word there in the beginning, but it says the Word was with God. Okay, so... So God obviously had a pre-existence. He, he's eternal. He didn't have a beginning, nor does he have an end. But it says that the word was with God. All right, I can follow that. But keep going. And the word was God. So which is it? Is he with God or is he God? Yes. Yes. All right, so that's a conundrum. What do we do with that? We'll talk more about that next week. So hold on. I'm not going to unpack every mystery in the, in the Bible and all, in one Sunday, but... So in the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. So he basically reemphasizes that. So there's the Word, there's God, there's God, there's the Word. Are you confused yet? Okay, let's keep going. Verse 3, all things were made through him. What's he done with the Word? Word, the word Word. He's personified it. Okay, The word is not an abstract principle here. The word is a person. So all things were made through him, him referring to the word who is God and who is with God. So all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. See, a number of individuals, including Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, they would say that Jesus Christ, the word, him, had a beginning and is part of the created order. What is John saying? No. If it was made, he made it. Period. If it was made, he made it. So anything that was made, he made. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of man. In other words, the word gives purpose, meaning, vitality and life to our existence, which he brought about. Now, that word, logos, depends who you are and your background in terms of what you associate with that word. You ever played the word association game? Okay, I throw out a word, you toss back the first thing that pops into your mind. If, if you throw out this word, 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 many people, and it may be in an evangelical crowd, the first thing they think of is the Bible, word, Bible. Is that correct? Sure it is. The word of God, okay? They, they think that. If you're, if you're in an academic setting and you say word, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Language, uh, um, concepts, spoken, spoken words that, that carry behind ideas, okay? If you're, uh, if you're at a rap concert and you throw out word, Totally different meaning, right? So it depends on, it depends on your background. How you, how you hear the word word depends on your background. John is writing to, to an audience of first century believers 
who come from different backgrounds. There's Christians who are Gentiles who have come to know Christ. They have a Greek background. And there's Christians like John and Peter who have a very Jewish background. And so when they hear the word logos, they have a different connotation in terms of what, what it means. And, and we're, I'm gonna, we're gonna dive into that. We're gonna dive into the meaning of logos, the word, word. Because this has some incredibly significant bearing in terms of who you are and who we are and why we exist, all right? So let's take a look at, first of all, the Greek understanding. John is writing the, the last of the four Gospels. Mark is first, then probably uh, uh, Matthew and Luke, and then finally John. He's the, the, the latest of, of the four chronologically. And, and he writes the Gospel of John so that we might know that Jesus is the Christ, and, in, and knowing him, we might have life through him, as, as chapter 20, verse 31 says. And he, he's writing to, uh, uh, when, when Mark and, and, and Luke wrote, there's the, the, it's, primary, it's, it's a good mixture. Now the church is growing to the point where it's predominantly Gentiles, predominantly Gentiles. So most people that are reading this, they're going to hear logos, and they're going to think of it in terms of what their cultural understanding of logos means. According to the historian Philo, who's a Greek and also a philosopher, he says the logos is the divine reason in whom are comprised all the ideas of finite things and who created the sensible world by causing these ideas to penetrate into matter. Greek philosophers believed that, or the Greeks believed that, uh, that the universe is here because of a divine principle or logos. They believed that there is a God and this God created the universe, although they didn't necessarily know how, how it all came into being. And they believed there was a reason that we're here and they called that the logos. Okay? So if you think of this, divine reason for being, that's how a Greek would hear that word. But there's a catch. There's a catch. And that catch is they also believe that although there is a divine purpose and that there is a divine reason and that there is a God, they also believe that you couldn't know the divine reason or the divine purpose or this God, and therefore, you may as well live as if there isn't a God. So they're kind of in a conundrum. Yes, there's a divine reason for being, but, you know, who can know? Who can know? It's similar to the agnostic. I'm not saying there's, there's probably a God. There's probably a God. But you can't know God, so what difference does it make? But man has to have a reason for being. Otherwise, you go insane. Otherwise, you sink into despair. And so the Greeks had a way of dealing with this, and they came up with two different schools of thought. Now, some, some of you are thinking, oh, could you just teach me the Bible? Relax. Okay? I'm trying to help us understand that we have succumbed to a worldview. You're going to see yourself in these. This is, an ancient hist- this is ancient history, and it's not ancient history. Okay? I'm going to describe our culture by way of describing their culture. You're going to see yourself, and you're even going to see that this has infiltrated even the church. Two schools of thought among the Greeks. Okay, there's a divine logos. There's a reason that I'm here, but you know what? I can't know the reason I'm here, so what do I do? Well, the Epicureans, a school of philosophy, they said that you can't know the reason for your existence, so live for pleasure. Uh, The bumper sticker for the Epicureans is is carpe diem. It means seize the day. If you're familiar with the Robin Williams movie, 1989, The Dead Poets Society, Okay, he taught his young students, carpe diem, seize the day. What that means is you're going to be food for worms someday. You don't know why you're here, so seize the day. Squeeze every essence of meaning out of everything that you do. Maximize your pleasure. Minimize your pain. Maximize your pleasure. Seize the day. Um, some people view this hedonistically. Uh, in terms of do whatever you can to, to, uh, to, to bring the maximum amount of pleasure. That's not exactly what most Epicureans in, in Jesus' day believed or even before Jesus' day. It was simply, okay, you, you're not going to live forever. You're here for a reason. You can't know it. So the best you can do is eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow. That would fit into that philosophy of life. Seize the day. Don't waste any moment. Enjoy every moment that you can because... Time is fleeting. So define your own purpose for living. Define your own purpose for living. Secondly, 
There's another school of thought, which are the Stoics. They would say, you can't know the reason for life, but you got to live as if there is a reason. And their bumper sticker looks this way. Virtue is sufficient for happiness. In other words, there's no ultimate reason for life, but do the right thing, and then you'll be happy. Kids, you ever ask your parents, they tell you to do something, and you ask why, and they tell you because it's the right thing? That's stoicism. That morality for morality's sake is stoicism. Now, how many of you have seen that in the church? Morality for morality's sake. It's not the gospel. But it passes for, it passes for the gospel. It's a counterfeit. It's not the real deal. It's bogus. Why should I obey? Because it's the right thing. Well, maybe it is the right thing, but why is it the right thing? Stoic says, because ultimately, if you live a disciplined life, you will maximize your happiness. Oh, so the reason I should be disciplined and the reason I should do right is because it will bring me the greatest benefit. Yes, that's stoicism. That has nothing to do with God's glory. It has nothing to do with divine purpose. It doesn't state that it has. It says, listen, you can't know God's purpose, so just live a disciplined life, be disciplined, do the right thing, raise your family, stay married, my husband's a pig. Doesn't matter. Stay married. Do the right thing. If divorce is wrong. Divorce will harm your children. See, you see all the motives for, for doing the right thing? It's because virtue is sufficient for happiness. Christ has nothing to do. God has nothing to do with why you do the right thing. Just do it. Just do it. It's very duty-bound. You see, Brooks, that's ancient history. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's very relevant. It's very... Uh, contextualized in our time. Uh, if you've been here for, uh, for the, the Hard to Believe series that we just finished a couple, uh, uh, or, or this uh, late fall, early November, uh, you, you might recognize, talked a little bit about Stephen Hawking, uh, a little bit about David, ha- um, uh, Richard Dawkins, rather, um, two, two scientists in terms of how they view the universe and so forth. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of this in what they say. Stephen Hawking in his, uh, his book, The Grand Design, which was written in the 90s, stated the following. The universe is designed, but since you can't know the designer, it may as well not have a design. Does that sound familiar? Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Technology has changed. Man's understanding of how the universe Works has changed, but the deeper questions, that's exactly what the Stoics and the Epicureans dealt with. Okay, granted, there's a designer, but you can't know him, so you have to basically define your own meaning in this world. Richard Dawkins, everybody's favorite atheist, said there's no purpose, there's no design, there's just DNA. This world is exactly the way we would expect it if there's no design. But, but you have to live as if there is a design. Did you catch that? Why did he say that? Because he's not an idiot. He knows that someone who doesn't have a reason for living sinks into despair. So you have to come up with one. Now, here's what Dawkins said about those who look to some exterior source for the reason for being. He says, there's something infantile in the presumption that somebody else has the responsibility to give your life meaning and a point. The truly adult view, by contrast, do you notice what he just did there? He said, he basically is saying, you're an infant if you look at it this way. This is the truly adult view. In other words, when you grow up, you'll come to know this. Truly adult view, by contrast, is that our life is meaningful as full and as wonderful as we choose to make it. Why are you here? See, Brooks, that's a hard question. Let me simplify it for you. I'll rephrase it. I would be happy if. What did you just fill in the blank with? That's your reason for being. That's your philosophy of life. That's the, that's the answer to Mark Twain's question. Why am I, the most important day of your life, the day you were born, and the day you find out why. 
Why am I here? This would make my life meaningful if I had this. What do you envision would give your life meaning? I would be happy if my spouse would change. I would be happy if I had a spouse. Some of you are like, I'd be happy if my spouse was dead. You say, oh, I can't believe you said that. You're thinking it, some of you. You wish your spouse was gone. And you're not going to strangle them, but it would be more convenient for you if they weren't around. Just telling the truth here, being real. Some of you are like, I'd be happy if I had more money. I'd be happy if I had better health. I'd be happy if I were smarter. I'd be happy if more people appreciated my awesomeness. I'd be happy if people liked me. I'd be happy if I had a bigger home. I'd be happy if I, if I had more leisure time. I'd be happy. Do you see where we're going? That's what you live your life for. That's how you define your existence. So I never thought of it that way. That's exactly what Mark Twain's talking about. Why were you born? Many people think, okay, if I do this, why am I born? Ah, because I'm pursuing this goal. I'm pursuing this endeavor. And I believe that once I get here, then my life will truly be fulfilling. I'd be happy. Moms think, I'd be happy if my children turn out the way that I want them to. And they don't. And so mothers are continuously wringing their hands. And they're not happy. And they question, their, they question the job that they did. See, how come you didn't lump in the dads? Because they generally don't think that way. And that's why you get mad at them, because they're not wringing their hands. What are they wringing their hands about? Their, their success in the world. I'd be happy if I could be successful. And you look at them and you say, oh, see, that's the problem with them. Look in the mirror. Do you see that you're both doing the same thing? You've said, I'll be happy if, and Christ is not the if. It's something else. You've done what the Stoic and the Epicureans done, and that is you've defined your own reason for existence. We all do it. We all do it, including those who are followers of Christ. Here's the irony, the irony, the reason. Back it up. They would both say, Epicurean and Stoic, they would say, okay, there's a divine reason. I'm not going to argue that. But you can't know it. Here's the irony. The reason man can't know the divine logos is precisely because man's defined his own way. Do you see the irony there? Genesis chapter 3, man had intimacy with God. They couldn't know him any more than they did. They walked with him. They talked with him face-to-face as friends. There was intimacy with, with the divine logos, the reason for their being, their creator. But they decided to define their own reason for existence separate from him, and that's why Isaiah says that your sins have caused a separation between you and God. That's the very reason that you can't know the divine reason is because we've defined our own way. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 8 says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end therein is death. Romans chapter 1. It's worth your time to turn there very quickly. Romans chapter 1. I'll try to read this uh, quickly. I'm not going to break every, every meaning of every word and every verse down. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they're without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But in their thinking, they became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Summary, here's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, listen, here's the deal. You knew God. You knew him. You know who he is. You know he's there. And and instead of of worshiping him and finding your meaning and, and value in Christ, in the word who created everything, 
You know he's there. What you've done is you've exchanged the glory of God for God, and you've put weight, that's what glory means, weight, you've, you've exchanged the glory of God for the glory of that which is created. In other words, okay, I could find my meaning and purpose in God, that which is truly weighty, glory, but I have transferred that glory to that which is not weighty, gold, silver, sex, prestige, money, power, idolatry. Things which are not necessarily evil in and of themselves, but I have made them ultimate things, and that's what gives my life meaning. That's Romans 1. That's precisely why you don't know the logos. So religion's the answer, right? How many of you know that this is a trick question and it's set up for me to punch you in the mouth, okay? You know, if you've been coming to grace for a while, you recognize this is a trick. Now, Why did I ask the question? Because religious people think that is the answer. And I'm including us in the religious group. Oftentimes we confuse religion with gospel. It's not the same. It's not the same. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, Greeks hear logos, they think divine reason, principle, abstract, okay? Jewish people don't hear logos that way. They wouldn't think in terms of how philo would express it. These are Jews, Peter, James, John, okay? They think in terms of the Hebrew Bible. They would hear the word logos and they would immediately identify it as the embodiment of the divine will, as in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. The grass withers and the the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. When they hear that word logos in the Greek, they think of God's decree, spoken commands, Spoken decrees, Sinai, the Ten Commandments. This is my will. It's not going away. I'm not changing my mind. That's what they think. Yeah, there's a divine reason, but they immediately attribute word to his spoken will for their lives. That's not incorrect. That's That's a very biblical way to view the word. They also proceed as personified wisdom, which is captured in Proverbs chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice on the heights beside the way? At the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portal, she cries aloud. To you, O man, I call, and my cry is to the children of man. So John's not unique in personifying logos. Solomon did the same thing. It's almost like, okay, wisdom. Wisdom's a person now? Uh Uh-huh. That's, they would see it both as the decreed command of God and also wisdom personified. That's how they would see it. But let's take a look at the problem. We looked at the problem with the Stoics and the Epicureans. In other words, when you define your own path in life, when you give life its own meaning, it becomes an end in and of itself, and that's the reason you can't know the uh, you, you can't know the maker. You don't have a personal relationship with him. So the answer is religion, right? Well, here's the problem with religion. Let's take a look at one of his divine decrees, his word, which shall not depart. The grass will fade, the flowers will wither, but here's, here's his word and it will never depart. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. You ready? This is God's decree. It's true for you. It's true for me. I don't care what culture you are, what sex you are. doesn't matter what time Here's the word which will endure forever. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, period. How are you doing on that? Remain silent, please, unless you're going to say, I fail. Who actually loves the Lord their God with all of their heart, all of their soul, all of their strength, and all of their might? Do any of you do that? Do any of you even try? You know why we don't? Is because we've defined our reason for being with 30,000 other things that don't involve Christ. And we believe that if I had those things, I'd be happy. See, that's why we don't love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that's, so what does that mean? It means that we have God's decree and we don't even keep it. Paul would have articulated it this way. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The word sin, the Greek word is amartia, it means to miss the mark. 
who's actually aiming at the mark is the question. Do you see the point? We're not even trying. And even when we try, we fail. So does that bring comfort? It doesn't. Actually, what it brings is a realization that we're separate from God because of our sin. That's what David expresses in Psalm chapter 51 when he's, he's confessing his sin to the Lord in Psalm 51. And he, he, says, he says the following, I know my transgression and my sin, it's always before me. Why is it always before him? Because he knows God's divine decree and he knows that he doesn't measure up. So religion shows you how you ought to be, but you're not it. So does that bring comfort to you? Okay, yes, we know there's a divine reason. We know that that divine reason has given us rules. He's given us decrees. He says, this is the way it is. I want all of your love. I want all of you. I want all of your heart. And that's right and that's good. And you say, amen. And then you go out and you give him a tenth of your heart, a tithe of your being, if you will. He says, well, I'm doing good to give a tithe. He doesn't want a tithe. He wants everything, all of you, your entire heart. You say, but my heart belongs somewhere else. Exactly. And the wages of sin, Paul says in Romans 6, verse 23, is death. That's precisely why we're separated from God. So religion does not, I repeat, it does not help man draw near to God. It just simply defines for us that we're not near him. Does that make sense? So where's the hope? It's not in religion and it's not in philosophy. The hope is in the gospel of John. The gospel generically, but in this case, we're going through John's gospel. The word gospel means good news. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. I'm going to jump ahead, skip a few verses, and go straight to John chapter 1, verse 12. But he speaks to the fact that those who are His own people rejected Him, but to all who did receive Him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. Born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You see, when you think of logos in terms of the Stoics or the Epicureans or even the Hebrews, it's impersonal, right? There's a reason for being. Can't know it, so you got to make up your own. Or there's a reason for being, and God has expressed it in his, his decree for your life. It's still impersonal. Here's what John's saying. John's saying, listen, God just didn't give you his will for your life. God took on human flesh and entered the world so he could connect with you, so he could have a personal relationship with him. So you could know him face to face as a wife knows a husband and a husband knows a wife and a father knows his child and a child knows his father. There's intimacy there. That's what God longs for. That's what he wants. And John is saying, listen, the word became flesh. He took on flesh and blood and he dwelt among us. He's going he's to make this clear to us. He's going to make this clear to us, but let's, let's take a look at what he said. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may have believed in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The Logos can be known, and he can be known in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, check out what Jesus said just before he was arrested. Okay, just before he was arrested in John chapter 17, verse 3, we'll get to this many, many months from now, but we'll get to it. He's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying that God would give him the glory that he had before the foundations of the world when he was with the Father. And then he says, and this is eternal life, that they, that is his disciples and all who believe afterwards, us, they that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. So go back, to, go back to chapter 20, verse 31. Christ came that you might have life. What kind of life? 
What does life mean? There, he defines it. This is eternal life, that you know God, that you intimately have a personal relationship with God. Well, how do you do that? By knowing Jesus Christ, whom he sent. The word of God, who is God, the word of God, who was with God, took on flesh and became man, and he has come that you might know the Father through the Son. This this is about you having a personal connection with God and Him being ultimately the reason you draw a breath. He wants to be your source of joy. He wants to be your source of happiness. He wants to fulfill your longings. He wants to give you longings that you don't even have. The Westminster Confession, the goal of this series the goal of this series, every sermon that's preached from this pulpit, whether I preach it or one of the other elders preach it, is the following. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And I like the twist that John Piper puts on it, just by changing one word. The chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying Him forever. Do you see, That's what the Gospel of John is intended for, to do for you, to do for us is to bring you into the place in your life where you, you are enthralled with the person and the work of Jesus Christ, that you have an intimate relationship with Him. Let me ask you this. Do you know Christ? I did not ask you, do you know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who gave His life for you on the cross, who was buried and on the third day rose again? That's knowing about Jesus. But that's not knowing Jesus. Jesus, some of you know me. Some of you know about me. There's a difference between knowing someone as an acquaintance, knowing someone as a historical figure, and knowing someone intimately in that you think their thoughts before they think them because you know them that well. Some of you have been married for many, many years. You know what your spouse is going to say before they say it. That's what it means to know God. That's what John 17, verse 3 is. You know him so well, you are so intimate with him that you think his thoughts as they are. He has permeated you. He he lives in you. He indwells you. He guides you. He is a light unto your path. I'm not just talking about the written word. I'm talking about the word that wrote the word. Actually, technically, didn't write the word. Inspired the word. You follow me? He indwells you if you're a Christian and he draws you into an intimate relationship with him so that your reason for being, your reason for being is his glory. And when you get to that point, absolutely nothing can ever take your joy. Ever. Your family may abandon you, but they can't steal your joy. Your health may founder, but your joy will never leave. I'll never forget. I know I've shared this probably hundreds of times from the pulpit, but we have a lot of new people, and you're just going to hear the same stories again and again and get used to it. The older I get, that's the way it's going to (laughs) be. All right? My wife got sick with Lyme disease. In 1998, she went undiagnosed until 2004. That's a long time to have that and not be treated. She got so bad that she couldn't walk. She couldn't hardly get out of bed. She was only sleeping one night a week. Intense headaches, felt like her body was on fire, digestional issues, knees hurt, everything hurt. Her whole body hurt. There were so many times when she would tell me, I just wish I could die and go home. And then she was finally diagnosed, and the doctor told her, Stacy, you're going to get better. And my wife wept, and she looked at me, and she said, I'm afraid. And I asked her why. She said, I'm afraid that if I get better, I'll lose the intimacy that I have with Christ. 
that's a woman who knows God and knows Christ because he'd stripped everything else away from her. Where's your joy? Have you discovered the reason you were born? It's not to raise kids, Mom. It's not to make a name for yourself, Dad. It's not to win an NCAA title, athletes. It's not to make a lot of money, students. It's not, none of those things are wrong. Those things are good. The reason you were put on this earth is to know God and to enjoy Him forever. As the ushers come forward, we're going to celebrate communion together. If you're not a believer, this is, this is for those who have trusted Christ. You say, well, I, I, want, I want Christ. I want in. Give yourself to Him. You say, what does that mean? It just simply means calling out to Him, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Save me from my sin and believing that he rose from the dead on the third day. You see, that's it? That's it. And grow in your knowledge of him, not intellectual knowledge of him, but your intimacy daily. It's by grace through faith that we're saved. And this is not of work so that no one can boast. So we're going to pass the elements out here. And because communion is a reminder that this is not just about... This is not just about knowing God intellectually. It's about experientially experiencing God personally. And what we do in communion is we experience, we literally taste the bread and the juice. We experience, there's, there's a sensory perception. So what we're going to do here is, the praise team's going to lead us in song. Hold on to these. Hold on to these. Don't, don't take them until I come back and I'll direct you. But as you listen to the words of the song here, think about your reason for being. Analyze. Communion is always a time to examine yourself. Always a time for let the Holy Spirit examine you. Let the Holy Spirit search your heart and reveal to you what is your reason for being. Not what you know it's supposed to be, but what do you believe, what do you define as your reason for being? And if it's not, if it doesn't line up with Christ... This is a time where you can say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I've made such and such my idol. Would you show me your presence? Would you draw near to me as I draw near to you? Then we'll come back and we'll celebrate communion together.